Hi, Odyssey Recapped here. Today, I'm going to explain an action drama movie named Snowpiercer. The film begins in 2014. The Earth is experiencing severe global warming and climate change, which could lead to the extinction of human life. Everyday people are counting on scientists to find a way to save the world, but even the scientists are worried because resources are running out quickly. When all of humanity is very close to disappearing, scientists find a special liquid called CW7. When the right amount of CW7 is in the air, the world is supposed to return to its original state. Without waiting any longer, the leaders of 79 countries decide together to put some CW7 into the air. The plan is carried out and works well. But the outcome is beyond anyone's imagination. Instead of fighting global warming, CW7 cools the atmosphere way too much, causing the whole world to freeze and return to the Ice Age. It's something that nobody expected, not even in their wildest dreams. Almost everyone freezes to death in under a week. Only a small group of humans survive by boarding a train called Snowpiercer, created by a railway expert named Wilford. The train has a special engine that can work even in extreme cold. It keeps moving non-stop, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The reason the train keeps moving constantly is that the heating system only works when it's in motion. If it stops, the train would freeze. The railway track connects different countries, as it's made by joining tracks from all over the world. The train takes precisely one year to complete a full circle on its track, and this is how people measure time on the train. 17 years have passed since 2031 and the train is still moving without stopping. People inside the train are split into three groups. The person in charge of everyone on the train is Wilford, who created it. He lives in a room above the engine storage. After him, there are the elites, but they are just a tiny fraction of the population, only around 1%. The people who live in the front compartments are the first-class passengers, and they have access to luxurious amenities like bars, fancy restaurants, saloons, hospitals and schools for their children. The second-class passengers reside in the middle compartments, and they work as laborers for the first-class people. They don't receive as many services, but they have the chance to work their way up to first-class in the future. In the smallest, windowless compartment at the end of the train, there is a group of freeloaders who are treated poorly, almost like cattle. They receive very few resources and are only given occasional black bars of gluten to eat. They survive by comforting themselves with the fact that they are still alive, but they don't even have the privilege of seeing sunlight or having better conditions. To provide food for the first and second class passengers, the train has a special greenhouse where vegetables are grown. This greenhouse produces enough vegetables to meet their needs. As for water, it is obtained by melting ice in front of the train, ensuring a steady supply of drinking water for everyone on board. One afternoon, two guards go to the last compartment to distribute food, which is the jelly-like substance called the protein bar. During this visit, they ask if there is a violinist on board because they need one to entertain the first-class passengers. An elderly couple steps forward, but there's a catch, only one of them can go with the guards to entertain the first class. The couple refuses to be separated, and the guards forcefully take the old woman and drag her husband away against his will. The leaders of the freeloaders are two young men named Curtis and Edgar. They work hard to help their community, but so far, they haven't been able to bring about any major changes. Every day, they receive a single capsule hidden inside a random protein bar. These capsules contain various messages, ranging from the train's blueprint to motivating quotes. This time, the message in the capsule reveals the name of the train's designer, Nam, who is currently held prisoner in the prison compartment. No one knows for sure who sends these capsule messages, but Curtis believes that the sender is a friend and ally to their cause. Over the past 17 years, the freeloaders have protested twice in their attempt to fight for equal rights. Unfortunately, both attempts failed and resulted in many deaths. Despite these setbacks, their determination to achieve equal rights remains unwavering. Curtis and Edgar, as the leaders, are continuously strategizing and planning their next move. They also work hard to inspire and encourage more people to join their cause and fight for a better future. Among the freeloaders, there is an old man named Gilliam. Despite missing one arm and one leg, he remains determined to improve their living conditions. Gilliam plays a crucial role as the spiritual leader of the group, providing guidance and support to everyone. His strong leadership and unwavering determination are what keep the community united and hopeful for a better future.
Curtis approaches Gilliam to show him the latest message, and they both suspect that someone wants Curtis to meet designer Nam. While they are discussing this, the guards suddenly enter the compartment and start measuring the height of every child present. After measuring, they choose two kids named Timmy and Andy and take them away with them. Timmy's mother pleads and cries for the guards to stop taking her child, but they ignore her and push her away. In the midst of this tense situation, a man named Andrew throws his shoe at the guards, which infuriates them further. Amidst the chaos, a new character, Minister Mason, is introduced. She is responsible for maintaining peace and security on the train, and she is also the only first-class person the freeloaders have ever encountered. As punishment, Minister Mason forces Andrew to keep his hand outside the train for seven minutes. When he brings his arm back inside, it is completely frozen. Disturbingly, the guards proceed to cut off his frozen hand with a hammer, causing him immense pain and bleeding. After the tumultuous events, the entire freeloaders' community seethes with anger. They are fed up with the continuous mistreatment and dehumanization they face. This time, the injustice has pushed them to their breaking point. Throughout the night, they come together and meticulously plan an elaborate scheme to confront and attack the guards, seeking to reclaim their dignity and rights. Rumors spread among the freeloaders that the guards' guns are empty after the last protest. Curtis decides to put the rumor to the test and takes a bold step. When the guy who brings food daily enters their compartment, Curtis approaches him and points the gun at himself, challenging the man to shoot. As anticipated, the gun is indeed empty, confirming the rumor. This revelation serves as a signal for the other freeloaders to initiate their planned attack against the guards. The plan succeeds, and the freeloaders successfully infiltrate the prison section of the train. Curtis finally meets designer Nam, whose name was mentioned in the last message. To his surprise, he finds Nam and his young daughter Yona in the prison. Both of them are addicted to a substance called Kronol, which adds complexity to their situation. Nam and his daughter Yona agree to join the freeloaders on the condition of getting enough Kronol. Curtis accepts and welcomes them. Nam, using his skills, opens a door to a compartment with a window, allowing the group to see sunlight for the first time in 17 years. As they continue through the train, the group enters the kitchen area designated for the poor class. To their shock and horror, they uncover that the protein bars they have been consuming are actually made from ground cockroaches. Moving forward, they approach the water filtrate area. Gilliam suggests keeping control of the filtrate as a bargaining chip with the guards. By having possession of the water supply, they can negotiate for equal rights in exchange for access to water, giving them a potential leverage to improve their living conditions. As they open the next door, a shocking sight awaits them, a large group of guards armed with axes is ready to confront them. A fierce battle breaks out, resulting in the loss of many lives on both sides. In the midst of the chaos, Nam notices something peculiar. He spots a point outside the train that was not visible last year when he was not in prison. This discovery raises questions about the train's journey and what changes might be occurring beyond its walls. However, for the moment, their focus remains on surviving the intense fight with the guards. Amid the ongoing battle, Nam's observation about the melting ice outside sparks hope that the outside world might be becoming habitable again. This discovery hints at the possibility of humankind eventually living on the ground once more. However, the hopeful moment quickly turns dark as Minister Mason, in a shocking announcement, orders the guards to kill 70% of the freeloaders. The situation takes a grave turn, putting the freeloaders in a dire and dangerous position as they face an overwhelming and deadly threat. As they pass through a tunnel, the guards gain an advantage with night vision goggles, leading to casualties among Curtis's group. Eventually, they capture Minister Mason, prompting her to order the guards to stop their attack. The situation remains tense and uncertain. The freeloaders are torn between wanting to kill Minister Mason and needing her to control the guards. Under pressure, she discloses that the abducted children are with the train's captain, Wilford. She is unaware of his intentions with the children but knows that he orders the capture of many of them. The revelation adds to the mystery surrounding Wilford's actions and intensifies the freeloader's determination to uncover the truth. In a precarious bargain, Curtis agrees to spare Minister Mason's life in exchange for her help in reaching Wilford's compartment. However, only a few people, led by Curtis, decide to accompany Mason. The majority of the group remains behind, prioritizing their safety. Before departing, Andrew creates a portrait of the group alongside Mason, placing a shoe on her head. 
it is a symbolic gesture and a response to Mason's previous derogatory comparison of the freeloaders to shoes meant to stay at the bottom. In the first-class lounges, the freeloaders are amazed by the luxurious amenities, including an aquarium, a greenhouse with fresh fruits, and a sushi station. Mason invites them to sit down for sushi and proudly showcases the lavish services available to the privileged passengers. The experience reinforces the freeloaders' resolve to demand equality and justice for themselves. As the others savor fresh fish, Mason is left to eat the protein bar, symbolizing the stark difference in treatment. The group proceeds to the next compartment, which is the school for children. From a young age, the children are subjected to brainwashing, being taught to idolize Wilford as their king and view freeloaders negatively. Timmy's mother inquires about the missing kids, and a little boy reveals that they were taken through the front door, providing a vital clue to their whereabouts. The revelation adds to the urgency of their mission to find and rescue the abducted children. As the train passes a significant location, the group notices the frozen bodies of seven explorers who had attempted to survive on land by jumping off the train a few years ago. The grim sight serves as a stark reminder of the dangers that lie beyond the train and the challenges faced by those who tried to escape. The group is surprised when they meet a man with a cart full of eggs. They thought all animals on earth were extinct, but the man laughs, dismissing it as a rumor, just like the story of the empty guns. This encounter adds to the mystery and raises questions about life beyond the train. In a sudden and brutal attack, the man with the cart and the teacher open fire on the group. Andrew is killed before Curtis takes down the teacher. The classroom's monitor shows Gilliam being shot dead by a guard in the last compartment. The group is left devastated and facing even greater danger. Gilliam's death crushes Curtis's spirit, leading him to shoot Mason in anger for revenge. The group then reaches a room with high-class people enjoying various luxuries, highlighting the stark inequality they face. Just before reaching the engine room, the group is ambushed by another batch of guards. They fight valiantly, but tragically, Timmy's mother loses her life in the battle. Now, the only survivors are Curtis, Nam, and his daughter Yona. The loss of a dear friend and ally further strengthens their resolve to confront the challenges ahead and uncover the truth about the train's mysteries. As they approach the door to Wilford's room, they find themselves in a club filled with high-class youngsters. Unable to open the door due to Nam's lack of expertise in this area, they take a moment to rest and gather their thoughts. During this time, Curtis recounts the harrowing story of their early days on the train when the lowest class received no food at all. Desperation drove them to resort to cannibalism to survive. This drives his determination to fight for his people. Nam reveals that life outside the train is possible and points to a visible mountain, sparking hope and curiosity in Curtis. Nam reveals that he is not an addict and has been collecting chronol to create an explosive. His plan is to use it to make a hole in the train and escape outside. As he is about to ignite it, Wilford's assistant intervenes, shooting him in the leg and capturing Curtis. In the next scene, Curtis comes face to face with the aging Wilford, the train's captain. Wilford unveils the shocking truth that he was the mastermind behind the capsule messages, deliberately inciting riots among the low class every few years. The purpose behind these riots was to keep the population under control, with a few people being killed as a drastic measure. The original plan was for the protesters to be killed when the train passed through the tunnel, but Mason's abduction disrupted everything. Surprisingly, Gilliam was aware of the plan and was secretly helping Wilford from within the freeloader community. Although Gilliam's intentions were to ensure the survival of the human population, Curtis can't help but feel disappointed in him for supporting such a ruthless and manipulative scheme. The revelation sheds light on the complexity of the situation and the moral dilemmas faced by those trying to survive in the confined world of the train. As Nam and Yona attempt to set off the explosive, they are attacked by the first-class assailants. Yona rushes to Curtis for help in desperation. In the chaos, they spot a compartment on the floor where Timmy, the poor kid, is working in between the engines. Wilford has chosen the poor children to carry out these repairs because the space is too small for anyone else. This revelation highlights the injustice and exploitation faced by the poor class, who are forced to do dangerous work while the first-class children enjoy a life of luxury and privilege. Curtis attacks Wilford, rendering him unconscious, and rushes to help Timmy in the compartment. Meanwhile, Yona lights the explosive, symbolizing their determination to break free from the train's oppressive system. The situation becomes tense as they await the explosion's outcome. Everything becomes very quiet for a short time, 
and then a big noise sets the whole train on fire. The train goes off the tracks and everyone inside doesn't survive because of the crash. In the final part, we watch Yona and Timmy come out of the destroyed train as the only ones who live through the crash. They see a polar bear close by, which shows that life on Earth is coming back, and they now have a possibility to stay alive. Make sure you subscribe and turn on the notification so you can watch more videos like this. Thanks for watching.